Sure, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So this was a talk I gave in uh, a conference on methodology in Turkey held uh, last year. Now my thinking has evolved since then. So uh, I will go over this and make some changes as we go. So uh, at that time I was talking about two papers of mine. One of them was called Reviving the Promise of Islamic Economics. Those people who founded the subject of Islamic economics in the early 20th century, they were, they wanted to create a revolution. <clears throat> Again, this ties in with the theme that we discussed in the previous lecture that uh, even Islamic economics also has to be studied in historical context. You cannot make it. So the, one of the major problems with trying to define Islamic economics <coughs> is that we are using the same box of Western knowledge that it has to be defined as a universal science. So we define it as Allah, Allah, something which is true universally. Islamic economics is what Muslims developed in early 20th century as an answer to capitalism and communism. So this is <coughs> understanding Islamic economics from the point of view of its historical context. When you understand this way, see, when you try to understand it as a universal science, then you have to say that it has been true since the 14th century at least. <coughs> since the <coughs> yani 14 centuries ago, since uh, um, the start of Islam. It has to be universal invariant. It has to be the same theory. So this is very difficult to understand. Uh, but because they define social science in this way, and since we are just copycats, so we also defined our Islamic economics in the same way, then we are trying to find a definition, and there is no such definition. So first we have to understand that social science is always historical contextual. So Islamic economics is a theory that was generated in early 20th century due to historical pressures of the time. What were the historical pressures? This was the <coughs> revolutions that were taking place. Basically, the uh, in the early 20th century, Europe had control over 85% of the globe. But during the two world wars, they were fighting with each other. 50 million lives were lost. The youth of Europe was destroyed. A uh, lot of changes took place and power of Europe was crushed. So it became possible for the colonized world to become free and independence movements were launched. But even then, even though European power was weakened, they were not gone. So a lot of p uh, places had to fight to get their independence and they had to fight bloody battles. So <clears throat> when you fight a bloody battle, you have to have some goal have to have a promise of some good outcome. And so one of the things was that we will live according to Islam instead of under the Kafir. But also there was uh, the, the Kafir was, the, the deen of the Kafir was no longer Christianity. It was capitalism. And they said that we are, uh, we are capitalists. And there was another deen that was communism. And basically because the whole world had come to believe in materialism. So economics was deen for everybody. The Karl Marx, he said that accumulation of wealth is the goal of society. And Adam Smith also said that accumulation of wealth is the goal of society. The only difference between the two is how to do it. So Islamic economics said that no, we have a system which is built on uh, justice on providing justice for all and justice in all realms, whether it is economic, political, social. And this is radically different from both communism and capitalism. And this is what we will die for. And this is what we will make a revolution for. So this is what Islamic economics was. And now, you see, when we understand social science is not universal invariant, it's historical, then this is what first generation Islamic economics was. <coughs> The key points of this paper was that 
the first generation recognized the conflict between modern economics and uh, Islamic principles. Modern economics was based on scarcity, competition, greed. Islamic was uh, based on Fazlullah, Allah Ta'ala has given plenty. And it is true, if you look at the needs of human beings, there is plenty on the planet to fulfill everybody's needs. Scarcity only arises when you follow havas, when you follow nafs. Then scarcity arises. Then you can never have enough if you follow nafs. So, um, uh, the first generation, this was how Islamic economics was born. And this is what Islamic economics is, if you understand that social science is always historical context. Keynesian economics is the economics of the Great Depression. Not the Great Depression, but understanding the Great Depression. And it cannot be understood for 2007. This is a different economics is needed for 2007. Although we can use some principles, we can borrow some ideas from Keynes, but other ideas are different. Many things are different. So every social science has to be contextualized in its history. So by 1975, the idea that there would be a revolution had failed. And there are reasons for this and I have discussed them elsewhere. So um, the first conference of Islamic economics in Mecca held in I think 76. <coughs> uh, they said that there is no revolution coming. So there is no new system. So what we have to do is to take uh, this uh, capitalism which we are living in and modify it to become Islamic. So this is a new way of thinking about Islamic economics. And again, this is what Islamic economics is. Once you consider that, it's defined by historical context. Now, um, these people, they said, okay, since there is no revolution coming, we must study capitalism in order to modify it. The first generation had not studied much of capitalism. They had rejected it. Also, some people had studied it, but even then they had studied it as an outsider. But these people went and studied it as insiders. They went to the, they got PhDs in economics like myself. And they got impressed by Western economics like myself. <coughs> and they said, okay, on the one hand, we have Islam. It has usul al-fiqah, it has mamalat, it has sooth, it has many rulings about economics. On the other hand, we have Western economics. It's a, it's a complete, objective, factual science. It is a set of universal laws. So let us just mix these two together. So this is what International Institute of Economics was built on. That on the one hand, we will teach Samuelson. On the other hand, we will teach the fiqh and mu'amlat. And by combining the two, we will get Islamic economics. So this was the concept of Islamic economics in the minds of many people including any Munawar Iqbal's son, he was coming and he said that this is what I have been trained to do, that on the one hand I should be a master in Western economics, on the other hand I should be a master in, uh, in uh, the laws of the Sharia and we just take put the two together and we get Islamic economics. But the problem with this was that the strong conflict between, the first of all Western economics is a deen, it is not a, it is not a science. It is a religion. It is the religion of worship of the nafs. So, uh, in the um, project for um, religion and development, which was done while I was here, I think it was 2005 or 6, uh, at Islam, it was launched by Birmingham University. And uh, we were partners in uh, Pakistan. They were partners all over the world. Basically, <clears throat> the idea of the modernists was that religion would just disappear. Because it was just superstition. And once reason spread throughout the world, religion would finish. So, by the time um, uh, the second millennium, 2000, and even before that, 1980s, they found that this is not true, this is not happening. In the 1960s, they said that modernism will take over the world, people will start thinking rationally, and everybody will understand that religion is just superstition, 
people will start using logic and facts and they will start they will stop believing in religions and so we don't need to we don't need to worry about what religion is and how it acts these people will be slowly become isolated and marginalized and they will disappear from the planet like the african tribes and many other things they have disappeared so modernity will spread and everything else will disappear so this was not happening so slowly people realize that religion is not disappearing is getting stronger and the post modern movement started saying that modernity itself is the new religion of ma mankind and it has many irrational assumptions in modernity there that exist and, and we have discussed some of them so with that the uh, the modern religion also was put into some shock and so why uh, early millennium many people started thinking that there is uh, something wrong with this uh, projection of west also the 2007 led to the global financial crisis which showed everybody that economics is not good so basically that created the space for the launch of the third generation third generation rejects the ideas of the second generation that islamic economics is a mix of western economics and uh, um, and uh, fiqh it says that fiqh and uh, uh, economics are totally opposed to each other and to the best of my knowledge this was in my islamic economics survey when i was trying to figure out what people has been doing that i took this point of view first and uh, i said that in this paper i will concentrate only on ideas of islamic economics which are opposed to the west i will ignore the places where they are the same because i want to find out what is the distinguishing feature of islam we are in fact the um, organizer of this project carol record he asked me that look what is the difference between islamic economics and western economics <laughs> so <clears throat> uh it was not easy to find if you if you look at this textbook that you have today <laughs> and you say what is the difference you will find a lot of philosophical discussion but when you come to analysis you will not find any difference if it's the islm curve it is uh, the labels on the axes are changed from interest to musharaka and then you have the same islamic economics and there is a reason for this because islamic economists believe that that is a science so it is true so the only thing we can do is change some labels and names but otherwise we have to follow the if it's a physical law if it's a law of gravity you can't say that i'm going to develop my own islamic law of gravity that wouldn't make not make any sense and once you believe that the economic science is a science and it's objective and factual and concrete then you have no option <coughs> but to accept it and that's what the second generation did <clears throat> so now understanding that modern economics is a religion it is not a science this gives us an and the religion is the religion of worship of the nafs it's directly opposed to islam so this means that you cannot combine the two so then you have to build on new grounds and then basically basically it involves going back to the ideas of the first generation that islamic economics is a revolution it is directly opposed to capitalism so <clears throat> the basic idea of third generation islamic economics which is what i have written in the paper what is islamic economics which we have discussed is that you know if you want to build islam you can't do it by mixing west and if you call something islamic it has to be built on quran and hadith it cannot be built on samuelson plus quran and that's what people have tried to and that's why there are 20 definitions because uh these two things the western economics and islam are fundamentally opposed to each other so in making a compromise you have a choice that okay there are these 20 principles of western economics i will take this one and uh, these three and reject these other 17 or somebody says no i'll accept these three and i'll reject so everybody is trying to find a mix but it doesn't mix so people choose different ideas from western economics this is what i will take some people say okay i'll take institutional economics some people say i'll take um, marxist economics and there is islamic marxism 
there is Islamic uh, capitalism, there is Islamic socialism. So whatever idea you take from the West, you can find a new mix. So that's why everybody has their own definition. So, so in my paper on what is Islamic economics, <coughs> uh, redefining Islamic, I say that, look, we will never get <coughs> to a definition, we will never get to consensus. We cannot all agree on what compromise to make. <coughs> the only way we can get to agreement is if we say only take from Islam, don't accept any mixture. So I say, okay, from the Islamic sources, what we will do is that Islamic economics is the effort. Islamic now you see we we are starting process oriented thinking. It's not you see Western economics is about accumulation of wealth, and it judges by whether or not you have got wealth whether the progress has been made, whether there is GDP growth. So I say, no, this is outcome. We don't care about the outcomes. Outcomes are in the hands of Allah. We care about the process. What am I doing now? <clears throat> so, uh, so that's why the effort is important. Am I implementing the order of Allah? So now what is the economics? It is the order of Allah in the economic affairs. That is all. So now, Economics examines the extent to which the order of Allah is being implemented. So, Am I doing what Allah Ta'ala has ordered me to do? Now this order can be at the individual level. I can pay uh, zakat, I can give sadaqat. Or it can be at the community level. Uh, it can be that, okay, we are, have the rights of the neighbors and uh, we have cooperation, we have social responsibility. This is called the kaful, taking care of the weak people. And then there is at the level of the ummah. Uh, and there are orders for the ummah to be together. Uh, so there are these three levels of orders. And at each level, trying to fulfill the orders of Allah. This is the Islamic economics. So, for example, <coughs> Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَا يُحَزُوا وَلَا تَعَامِلْ So the uh, Muslims are Muslims are ordered to try to feed the poor. So if I write a paper about how we can feed the poor, that is the process of trying to write this paper. That is Islamic economics. Not what is written in the paper, but the effort to uh, implement the order. So if we are sitting here and thinking about how Islamic orders about economics like zakat, sadaqat, uh, waqf, uh, social responsibility, how these can come into the world, then we are doing Islamic economics and that is ibadah, that is worship. <coughs> when we uh, do this, then teaching and learning turned into act of worship, not if we are studying Sam Olson, which is the opposite. <coughs> and if we do that, we studied this, just discussed this question in the first lecture, is it, when you take notes, is that, is your ink like the blood of the martyrs? Well, not if you are taking notes about Samuelson. But if you are taking notes about uh, how the order of Allah will come into being in this world, then it can be the blood of the martyrs. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, the second part of this talk which was given in Turkey was to explain to people that economics is not what it appears to be. Because that is the key. And if we are talking to Islamic economists, then uh, the first thing we need to explain is that economics is not what you think it is. It is the thousand snakes principle. That the appearance of economics, what it claims for itself, and what the reality of economics is, is very different. So. Um, I explained that in that seminar by explaining seven deceptive concepts. <clears throat> I said that 81%, in order to label it, it's useful to label it as economic theory of the top 1%, because I say that the Islamic economics is really 80-90%, it is the economic theory of the bottom 90%. In that sense, also, it is opposed to 81%. So, it is um, um, 
for now this is actually part of the dava strategy for someone who is completely brainwashed in believes in economic theory then um, if you say that islam is opposed to economic theory this is a real problem for him because for a person who believes in economic theory then if uh, then either he has to, then you are directly attacking his faith he has to believe that islam and economic theory are the same otherwise he will have to reject his faith so that is why the islamic economists never mentioned the ayat which are against the idea of nafs they do, they all mention hubbu shahwat min an nisa because that shows that people have nafs but there are many ayat which are against this there are many ayat which are against the dunya and the pursuit of dunya but they all mention only rabbana atina fi there are only two ayat in the quran which are in favor of nafs and these are the two which the islamic economist always cite and all of the uh, 20 or more ayat which say that dunya is bad and you should not pursue dunya and why have you become contented with dunya these are never mentioned by islamic kind because they conflict with the aqeedah of uh, the western economics so the strategy for talking to such a person is not to go and say that islam is opposed to economics uh the strategy say that economics of the top 1% is opposed to economics of the bottom 90% right so now they were not talking about deen we are talking about dunya so now we can say that okay economics why why do you want to believe in the economics of the top 1% why not believe in the economics of the people so if we set up this opposition so this has to do also with power knowledge i said that there are two bases of strength of modern economics one is the historical trauma which led them to deny the akhira deny the afterlife deny the heart deny uh, life after death and then the only object becomes to make this dunya into jannah and so that can be done by accumulation of wealth and by pursuit of pleasure and that's exactly what economic theory is so this is the deen of rejection of god but now if we if we attack it on these grounds then somebody who believes that economics is objective positive factual uh, will not agree and so we say that economics comes the other source of strength of economics is the power aspect that economic theory actually protects the power of the uh, top 1% so if we expose that then we can oppose uh, economics and we can oppose it on secular grounds and these grounds the bottom 90% islam is in favor of helping the poor so this is not 80 90% is not exactly the same as islamic economics but it is much more in sympathy with the uh, islamic economics and it is the right place to attack 81% so if i am talking to people who believe in modern economics then this is the right place and this is how i and that was my audience most of the people were very strong defenders and uh, some of the people at this economics conference said that utility maximization is completely an islamic principle and and many other things like uh, islamic economists generally say so i said that okay basically you see the 1% they don't have the physical power to rule over the 90% so they have to have they have to use soft power they have to promote theories which everybody will believe and these theories will actually be the source of the power that means that the theory must the economic theory cannot be the theory that the 1% are entitled to rule over the 90% because that theory the other people will not agree to so it has to have the appearance of fairness it has to look like it is equitable but it must hide a bias towards the wealthy so this is a very important so not all theories will qualify many there are many theories which will favor the poor but the theory has to be acceptable to all so it has to be a deception and this was the crucial insight of karl marx he said that capitalism does not work by brute force it works by making the laborers believe in the necessity fairness and justice of their exploitation 
so now i will uh, now i will examine seven concepts of uh, traditional economics and i will show how all of these are actually deceptive they have the appearance of fairness and neutrality but they actually strongly fear the rich and the powerful and that's what makes them 81% and then once we see that then we can oppose them by an 80 90% that there is another theory it is uh, it is also neutral and objective but it favors the 90% instead of the 1% so this is another way of understanding why conventional modern economics is wrong and bad so pareto optimality more give more to everybody okay who could object to that society is made better off if you give more to everybody uh so far it seems very fair and neutral i am asking about everybody but uh it also has the idea that suppose i have a reform that makes the rich even richer then that is good for society now many people have said that this is not good for society if you make the rich even richer because that will give them more power to exploit karl marx said this take the power away from the rich by taking the capital away so but uh, pareto optimally says no and in fact some of the people uh, capitalists have strongly defended this that okay why why should the poor be jealous as long as they are not being hurt uh, let the rich be richer and so this is uh, this is uh, feldman is it cited he is making specifically this and said okay we make this economic reform and the people argue that this will only make the rich richer he says that that's fine i have no objections that's making the society better off uh, is, are the poor going to be hurt by this so if they are not going to be hurt then pareto optimality is fine but this is not good we don't agree with that and in fact islam does not agree with that islam says that uh, do not let this be concentrated in the hands of a few so uh, this pareto optimality is opposed to islam which is something which people don't uh see and understand but another thing that is concealed within this principle is that if you take any wealth away from the rich then uh, you it is not pareto superior so it means that feeding the poor is not good for the society again this is opposed to islam it says that in the uh, in the wealth of the poor there is a haq of the in the in the wealth of the rich there is a haq of the poor so uh anybody has more than their need they have the responsibility to feed the poor again this is uh, uh, pareto optimality is opposed to this principle is opposed to islam so um as an alternative i uh, propose the pareto health principle a, a distribution is a redistribution of income is good if everybody's health is going to be improved by this we can also take it as welfare welfare i, I use health for uh, because that's something you can measure uh, and uh, if i am talking to economists then i need to focus on measurable things because that's all they believe in but otherwise you can say if somebody if something will make everybody is welfare better off where welfare is not measured in terms of the amount of wealth you have now the uh, in economics welfare is the same as wealth again this is because of the confusion between the observable and the unobserved So if somebody has more wealth he has more welfare if somebody has less wealth he has less welfare that's the theory but that's not true in fact the quran says that if you give people more wealth it will make them more uh, rebellious so actually more wealth is bad for people so um so we say anyway that okay so if i take money away from the rich and give it to the poor then their malnutrition will increase they will be able to take medical treatment they will live longer what about the wealthy they will not be shortening their lives because they will get all the food they are eating they will get all the health care that they want all their necessities will be taken care of so if we look at the effect of consumption on health we will find that the wealthy can give away a lot of wealth without having their health affected but the poor they you can improve their health a lot so this is a good redistribution so this is a very sensible logical principle for redistribution which is opposed to the pareto principle but in line with the islamic principles now this this idea is uh, opposed by the capitalist economists and in fact the libertarians the philosophy behind 
capitalism says that the rich man has the right to feed crumbs to his dogs and let the starving man die at his table begging for bread. This is what they say. This is the philosophy which is underneath, which is being supported by Pareto optimality. So Pareto optimality actually supports inequality and power and this leads to corruption in the land and this principle is designed to say that do not take any money away from the rich and powerful. So that's how this is 81% and that's why we should oppose it. And we say no, if somebody has more than enough for their reason, then we should tax it away and give it to the poor. The invisible hand principle is another one like that. This is says that if everyone acts selfishly, this will uh, do good for the society. So basically this says that, okay, let the rich and powerful do whatever they want. Now, uh, again, this has the appearance of fairness. Ev let everybody do whatever they want. So it's equal. I can do whatever you want and you can do whatever you want. It has the appearance of neutrality, but the reality is very, very harmful because if somebody is poor, he doesn't really have any choices. Only thing he can do is he can sell his life to the rich person to get food. And that's what that's his only choice. So he is free to sell himself. Uh, the rich man, he can do whatever he wants. And that's what the invisible hand said. Let him do whatever he wants. And so people say, well, if you let him do whatever he wants, then he will get even more wealth. So he said, that's good for society because there's more wealth in the society. It will trickle down to the poor. So according to Islam, we have innam al-amal bin niyat. If uh, you let everybody selfishly pursue their pleasure, that's not good for society. Uh, if somebody, basically there is a conflict between your selfish desire and the society. If uh, invisible hand says there is no conflict. If everybody pursues their selfish interest, this is the best for the society. So this is obviously wrong. Uh, what is good for me is not good for society. We frequently have conflicts and we frequently ask children that you should do something which is good for other people and don't follow your selfish desire. So today we see that allowing, this is the way to allow greed. Everybody, let everybody act greedily and this has very bad effects. The Great Depression was caused by greed. The global financial crisis was caused by greed. Today wars are taking place all over because the corporations want to increase their wealth. So there is enormous social cost of selfish behavior. So it's a real problem. Why does this invisible hand theory, which is so obviously wrong, continue to be believed and propagated? And the idea, the answer is power knowledge. It's the uh, top 1% whose interest it is to propagate this theory that the, our best interest is also the best interest of society. That's what they are saying. So economics is a branch of moral philosophy. This is what we have to see because this is also another appearance and reality. Economics claims to be positive and objective, but it's actually a moral argument. It is saying that this is right and this is wrong. So Pareto optimality is a moral argument. Uh, this is a moral argument for selfishness. That let everybody be selfish because it will produce the best result for society. And in fact, uh, the libertarians, Hayek and the extreme one, they say that there is nothing, there is no such thing as society. There's only selfish interest. So if everybody is pursuing their self-interest, this is the meaning of social interest. So it is a moral philosophy. This is, this is an ethical argument. The production function is another moral argument. It says that how does production pay? There are two factors of production. One person brings his capital. The other person brings his labor. This is a, a myth, a deception. We are not looking at what's happening here. The capitalist is bringing a machine. The other person is bringing his life. They cannot be treated as equals. The person who is giving his life, you are, the capitalist is buying his life. The marginal product of labor is what the, the life is uh, infinitely precious. This life could be devoted to many things. Now when the capitalist hires the laborer, he is, uh, he is actually doing something which, um, so, so it creates a symmetry which is not there. 
Capital is one factor in labor, but capital is not the life of the labor. The, the capitalist can live without capital, and he can live without return to capital, but the laborer cannot. But the Mudarba concept of Islam is uh, uh, probably the same. Yes, but in that case, you see, that's a, in the Mudarba, what happens is that they are partners in a joint enterprise. In the capitalist system, the um, capitalist purchases the labor and the output belongs only to him. So this is a, a big difference. So there are many reasons why many people have argued that this production function theory is wrong and the idea then that there is a marginal product of labor and marginal product of capital. So both get fair share. This is also wrong. And uh, there's the Cambridge critique, the, which says that, you know, capital cannot be aggregated. So there are many critiques, but basically the, the key is that labor and capital are not symmetric, not factors on par. We have to deal with human lives differently. Human beings are precious. And Islamic theory of labor is completely different. And, uh, that has been formulated. <coughs> so one of the theories that comes out of the uh, production function is the marginal product of capital and labor. Now, if you look at what really happens in capital uh, firms, so you look at this graph, it shows that the worker pay has remained the same, but the CAO pay has increased dramatically. It is now 300 times more than typical workers. So is it true that they are receiving the pay for their marginal product? This is again the basic moral argument that is made to justify the uh, capitalist system. But uh, there are many, many ways to see that this is not true, that the CEO is not 300 times more productive than the um, average laborer. Uh, many arguments have been made to show this. For example, the CEO is just chosen from one of the joint directors who is second level. Second level is already making only half of that salary when that person gets appointed CEO. His function and role doesn't change. The work he's doing doesn't change. He's just the boss. But uh, the productivity doesn't change, but the pay goes up. So actually, the pay is not the marginal product. But um, the this is a moral argument that is being made. And it is again being made to justify the earnings of the rich. See, the standard argument that we make, the 80-90% is that some people are earning more than they are worth and they, 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 than they are producing. Uh, you see, every person contributes some value to society and he has some earning and these two are different. So we say that if somebody is, should get compensation according to what he is contributing, that his marginal product, but not more. So economic theory says that everybody does get his marginal product. And 80-90% uh, and would say, no, some people are getting a lot more than what they are producing, and so you should take that away. So that is what uh, economic 81% prevents us from doing. So the master trick of the, uh, of the economic theory is the use of GNP per capita everywhere being used. So what we really should do, okay, if, suppose I'm going to look only at wealth, look at the wealth of all the people, look at the wealth of the bottom 20%, look at the wealth of the... So they say, no, 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 we're not going to do that because that will uh, show us what we don't want to see. What we do is we just take all the wealth in the, all the society and then what is GNP per capita? Divide it equally to all people. <laughs> that is what GNP per capita is. So now this GNP per capita is a myth. It's like a unicorn. It's a fairy tale. It doesn't exist. So um, we can object. Look, GNP per capita is not good. Why don't we look at the GNP? What, what we can do very realistically is look at the five quintiles. And that's what's done in Heisen. Look at what's happening in the top quintile, what's happening in the second. And uh, instead of saying GNP per capita, we say, okay, GNP of the top, we, we look at five numbers. Then we can see that, okay, the poor are going down and the rich, are, if the poor go down by 50% and the rich increase, uh, wealth double, then the economy has improved because the rich were already rich. So the doubling will give you, rich have $100 and they get 200 
the poor had one dollar and now he gets 50 cents so the loss is only 50 cents and the gain is 100 dollars so you, the society is better off so GNP per capita says that oh we are doing wonderfully and this is what's happening today everywhere in the world the rich are getting enormously richer the poor may not be getting poorer but their one dollar remains at one dollar and they get more uh, exploited and uh, everybody says oh uh, they, their one dollar goes to one dollar ten cents look poverty is being improved this is what they say so we are we are making progress in poverty and the fact that the rich had go have gotten uh, enormously more uh, better this is not this is answered by trickle down okay so temporarily the rich have lot more money but this will trickle down to the poor so they will also be better off in the long run so again this is this theory gnp per capita itself is 81 percent it is a trick to deceive the people into thinking progress is taking place when in fact the people themselves are being deprived because before measuring the GNP you divide it equally. When you look at the data you find that there is no trickle down. This is the data from US Census Bureau. The dotted line is the poverty rate which has been going up uh, and the GNP per capita has also been going up. So the um, and it came down up until the 1970s we have uh, not discussed the history but up until the 1970s Keynesian theories were in in practice and so uh, there was full, full employment after 1970s the Reagan Thatcher revolution took place and the free market policies started to become dominant and from that free market policy the 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 share of the top 1% which is the solid line oh no that's per capita GDP that has been the GDP per capita GDP has been increasing economy is growing wonderfully but the poverty rate is also going up so there is no trickle down. So basically the rich and powerful dominate the media and they project the news so which we all believe so uh, the tobacco industry hid the link between the cancer and tobacco for a long time. They hired consultants and they ran propaganda campaigns and they so it was eventually discovered today you know in the 1970s 80s the same, same, same thing took place the, there was a discovery that the uh, uh, American population is eating too much sugar they are becoming obese they are developing many kinds of diseases diabetes is the worst one and it's sugar which is the cause so the sugar industry was at threat so there were some researchers who were hired and they said that no no sugar has nothing to do with it, it's oil and so all of us we believe that we shouldn't eat fat and asli ghee is bad for you and uh, fried material is bad for you because oil is converted to fat but this is not true oil has nothing to do with it you can eat uh, asli ghee all you like it's not it's good it's, good. it's calories it will make you fat but <laughs> it is not the source of the diabetes and the disease the source of all the problems is too much sugar that was true in the USA in Pakistani diet also as sugar has been increasing the, the poor person doesn't eat that much sugar but uh, as the sugar becomes more available and more cheap then it becomes more utilized and it makes everything taste sweet and it also leads to diabetes and it leads to many other diseases it leads to obesity so the point of this is that the what the dominant story is depends on power it doesn't depend on truth so just like we all were made to believe that oil is harmful we were all made to believe that tobacco doesn't ca cause cancer for a while so we are all made to believe this economic theory which only protects the interests of the top one percent again private property is an 81 percent idea it says that the property belongs only to the person who has it and he has absolute rights over it this is opposed to the Islamic idea Islamic idea of property is that property is amana you should uh, you have to keep it so if the Islamic concept of property was being in place today we would not have this sustainable development problem today the western concept of property is you can do whatever you like you can cut off forests you can kill birds but in Islam 
we have been given this world as a plant as a trust we cannot do whatever we will we cannot destroy forest we cannot pollute streams because our generations have to inherit what we have in a better condition than what we found it but the west doesn't believe in this the western private property says that if i own something i can do whatever i like but unfortunately muslims uh have said that capitalist private property is the same as islamic because you see what they saw was the difference between capitalism and communism in communism they said that the <coughs> the resources production will be owned by the state so they said no islam doesn't have state ownership of capital they only have private property they didn't understand that uh, in the quran it says ya shuaib the qaum shuaib asked shuaib that does your religion tell you that we cannot do what we like with our properties so this uh, yani the quran tells us explicitly that property is only an amana it is a trust you cannot do what you like with it <clears throat> so uh, islam also says natural resources are gifts of god and they can they must be used for public wel- welfare so even you know this applies to sui gas and things like that nobody can own it privately because this this is a gift of god it's not doesn't belong to any one person but capitalism thinks differently if i if i uh, buy a property and i own it then if it has gas in it it is mine so that's uh, not according to islamic ideas again this is a uh, 81% idea because only the very rich can buy up islands and uh, oil fields and stuff so if we prevent them from buying up natural resources we say this cannot belong to the uh, person this cannot belong to the seven sisters today we would not have climate change if we would say that all the oil in the earth this is a gift of god and it must be used for the common benefit of mankind it is not allowed for some private people to use it and make their profits from it if this principle is enforced all climate change would stop and a major problem with capitalism would be stopped but unfortunately islamic economists who have this knowledge are not using it to oppose conventional capitalism utility maximization is another economic theory again it says that everybody should be free to pursue their pleasure and they are free to define their pleasure this was invented by jeremy bentham as a new religion to oppose christianity he said now see christianity is gone so how will we decide what is something good and what is something bad what is the concept of sin and concept of sawab is no longer present so is it very simple if something gives you pleasure it's good something gives you pain it's bad this is exactly the same as religion of worship of the nafs it's not permissible for muslims to teach this theory because muslims cannot teach the quran says explicitly that it may be that something is good for you and uh, you don't like it and uh, something is bad for you and you like it this is exactly opposed to utility maximization utility maximization says that if you like it it's good for you so all of this is to show that we cannot follow the methodology of conventional economics so what can we do to create a different methodology well as i said uh, the economics is based on fulfilling the orders of allah so one of order of allah is to urge the feeding of the poor so this means that creating an 80 90% is one of the imperatives of islam creating a theory which will support the interests of the poor because the 81% is supporting the interests of the rich and that is the weapon that they use to dominate the world and to poison our minds so opposing that is part of islamic economics creating a new theory which supports the interests of the poor and this is required so this is one of the parts of the methodology we should try to uh, create theories which protect the uh, interests of the poor and which provide economic justice so one of the things that we need to do whenever we do something is to purify our purpose and so 
in doing economics we must make sure that we are doing it with the right purpose and so as allah taala said that in the salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mati lillahi rabbil alamin and man and jinn was created ma khalaqnal jinna wal insa illa liya'budun so we must yani study economics as an act of worship that's part of islamic economics unless we say if unless we do this as ibadah this is not going to be islamic economics so this is one of the requirements so we cannot study it by uh, for, with wrong intentions so all of the creation of allah is the family of allah and those who serve the family for the love of allah become beloved by allah this is one of the hadith qudsi so we must do economics in order to serve mankind but that is not enough to serve mankind must be done for the sake of the pleasure of allah for the love of allah if we just serve mind find so that we will become popular we will become famous we might even do it to become rich today a lot of money is in poverty we do poverty research you can become rich so <clears throat> this is a common motivation so all of this i i will have a career i will uh, have a career in microfinance and uh, i will make a lot of money by lending money to the poor at interest so then we must make the intention the students of uh, islamic economics teachers of islamic economics that we are not doing this to maximize personal pleasure we don't seek anything for ourselves we seek only to serve allah the creation of god out of the love of allah so to do this uh this is to carry out the orders of allah and this is meant for tazkiya so the ultimate goal is to purify our heart of the love of this dunya the love of fame popularity the love of career wealth uh status rank all of these things which we are seeking this is what we are studying for our education is to give us fame to uh, wealth uh, to make us popular to make us admired to give us respect all of these are wrong ideas wrong intentions with which we are studying so we have to make tazkiya we have to clean our heart that's a necessary part of islamic economic methodology so allah taala says that the in uh, sa'yakum lashatta there are many different purposes and the western theory of human behavior and human welfare is beyond ridiculous yani it's just uh, even child understands that humans do, are not like that and human welfare does not come from maximizing of uh, consumption so reject that yani this this shock and awe this is the first step that we have to reject the batil that la ilaha that west is not my god western economics is not true is just garbage this is a, a, an argument i have frequently had with islamic economists i said that uh, western economics garbage they say oh this is your iman speaking and um, you know we shouldn't reject everything the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he borrowed ideas of the ditch from persia and he and the sahaba they borrowed lots of ideas so this is they don't yani the rejection of the west already caused them pain because it's their deen when it's deen then to reject it is is painful so even completely ridiculous theories we are not prepared to reject So Allah wa li al-lazina amanu yukhrijuhum min al-dhulamati ila an-nur wa al-lazina kafaru aliyahum at-taghut yukhrijunuhum min an-nur ila dhulamat ulaika ashab an-nar hum fi khalidun And then there's a ayat that they do not be like those who have forgotten Allah and Allah Taala made them forget themselves So those people who disbelieve they have forgotten their own selves you see the theories that they are trying to push the utility maximization it does not maximize his own utility homo economicus doesn't exist and should not exist as uh, amartya sen has said that uh, rational behavior rational fools is his article if somebody actually acts rationally as per economic theory he would be a fool 
because you see we all live inside society and we we are supported by society if i am completely selfish and i don't care anything about you do you think you can't sense it of course everybody can sense it um i have seen with my eyes that if a person doesn't care for anybody doesn't care for his wife doesn't care for his children then when he is when you are when the children are carrying the janaza they are talking about who will inherit what they don't they, they, nobody has any tear in her eye then if a person is a little bit less selfish he cares about his wife and children but doesn't uh, care about his neighbors then you go to the janaza and you will see that his wife and ch children are crying everybody else is uh, making gap shap but when somebody is cares for his neighbors you can see that also in the mahalla everybody is uh, when you are carrying the janaza everybody is feels grief that yes this was a person he was kind and uh, nice to us and if somebody serves the whole nation then uh, the whole nation mourns for him when his janaza uh, hundreds of millions so what we care for determine so we cannot live independently that i am completely selfish i don't care about anything about anybody else this is what economics teachings tells us you are west one individual there is no community no society just worry about yourself this is how community this is very foolish behavior because if you are cut off from community you are nothing so the economic theory of behavior is completely wrong so how can we uh, so what we need to do start from zero what is human behavior start by studying your own self allah taala says that uh, everyone knows his own self so we understand human behavior by looking at our own heart this is the first place to study human behavior <coughs> so man arafa nafsahu fa qad arafa rabbuhu this is a call from ibn arabi so if we study ourselves this is also a way to get to know god because allah taala's signs are manifest in our souls so uh, then useful knowledge enters our heart study our own hearts to learn about our motivations learn to distinguish between what is our need and our desire learn to control desires learn to this is islamic methodology because we are trying to implement the orders of allah so how to implement the orders of allah we have to learn to recognize when our nafs is in uh, is in control and nafs amara is trying to control us and what our ruh is telling us so we have to study our own heart to distinguish between these two because as you have studied in earlier lectures i have explained to you that what you think and what you do is not your real thinking and doing you are thinking and acting acts from others and you have been uh, you have accepted ideas and propaganda of others and when you think about yourself you would say that oh this is not what i really believe so when i ask you about what your purpose of life is you will say as a muslim that my purpose is to please allah to live for allah and to die for allah everybody will say this but is it really your action no and it you are not acting like that and you are not even thinking like that so you are deceiving yourself you you think that you uh, you are muslim and you are thinking muslim thoughts but your actual thoughts are different from those muslim thoughts so you have to fix this problem you have to fix this disease which is in the hearts allah taala said in the hadith that there will a disease will come into the hearts of the mu'min and he will uh, start loving this life of world and start um, hating the akhirah and when this happens then the kuffar will dominate the muslims and this is the situation today so we have to cure this disease we have to start loving allah and akhirah and then this worldly life will be made um, subservient to us it will be given into our control so this is the self analysis will teach us the real complexity this is the question which was being asked earlier that human behavior is not simple it is not maximizing it's very complex we have different ideas uh, heart is uh, telling us something else our mind is telling us something else our ruh is telling us something else and all of these things we have to integrate and so allah taala says about this fa alhamaha fujurha wa taqwaha so at the same time we are being told that this is the good thing and this is the bad thing 
And the nafs is saying, go, 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 do the bad thing. In the nafs alamaratim su, the ru is saying, no, 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 don't do that. That will be bad for you. So, the Western question is that there is a human nature, a true human. So, when they found, uh, they thought that human nature is selfish, then they, they did behavioral economics and they said, oh, some people are acting generous. So, now there's a question, a section in the book. Is there, are human beings generous or selfish? So, this is the wrong question because we understand that this is not the question. Every person has generosity in, it, in him and every person has selfishness in him. And this question doesn't need to be asked. We can look at our hearts and we can decide. We don't need to run experiments. We can look at our own hearts and we can see that sometimes I'm generous and sometimes I'm selfish. And I can tell when I will be selfish and when I will be generous. And there are conditions. So Islam is not about observation. Islam is about taking action. How can I strengthen the force for good. How can I act generously even if my nafs is telling me that act selfishly. So how can I strengthen the soul? How can I strengthen the forces of good? How can I take action? So this is what Islamic economics is. It's about the ground reality, about how it teaches us how to live. This is what knowledge is. Knowledge is about teaching how to live. It's not about some abstract theory on the ground about the world. So the key to Islamic economics is transformational. How to bring about change. How to change people. Qad aflaha man tazakka. How can we purify our own souls? And how we can teach others to purify themselves? So there is um, ayat in the Quran that whoever is saved from his own selfishness, they are the successful ones. So selfishness is there in everyone. But we have to seek protection from our own selfishness. The desire to do bad is built into us. That is what Hubbu Shahwatam Minusa is. Not about utility maximization, this I verse. People are thinking that this is the same as utility maximization because the man has the desire for women and horses and gold and silver. So this is not utility maximization. This is, this is, the, this is the bad desires in our heart which are put for a test. If these desires were not there, then there would be no test. Then men would be angel. Hmm? Yeah. Ah, so we have to do jihad against our nafs. This is the directly opposite message of economics. The economics says that he who fulfills his desire, maximizes utility, is successful. This is what uh, economics is teaching you. The more you can get, the better off you are. Muslims is Exactly the opposite. We have to fight against these desires in order to achieve tazkiya. Lan al birra hatta tunfaqo mimma tuhibboon. We have to avoid israf, avoid tabzir. We have to learn to live simple lives with minimal standard of living. The West says maximize your standard of living. Islam says minimize your standard of living. Take the smallest amount of dunya. Not, not, not like rehbaniyat. Uh, eat comfortably. Dress comfortably, but no, don't any, don't try to maximize the standard of living. Have an acceptable standard of living, and that's it. So there are three stages of spiritual progress. There's nafs amara, which is Western economics. Nafs lavama, which is second generation, try to mix the two. And nafs mutmainna is third generation, which is saying that. Uh, when you when you make how do you basically everybody starts out with love cell lavama and that's the average actually uh, the child is born on the deen al fitra but very soon he's trained away from this deen so he starts uh, to become mixed up in worldly desires so um, in love cell lavama at all points we have the choice we can go towards allah or we can go towards dunya when we make when we take more and more steps towards dunya, then we will become nafs ammara like homo economics. If we take more steps towards God, then we will become nafs mutmainna. When you have nafs mutmainna, then when you do good, it comes naturally. It comes, it pleases you. If uh, if you do something bad, you don't like it. You don't want to do it. You are you are you are uh, disgusted by doing something bad. But if you have nafs ammara, then you like doing bad things, and you dislike doing good things. And nafs al is in the middle. 
so this is the 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 spiritual progress and this is what we have to strive so to bring the order of allah in our lives we have to make the intention that from now on i seek nothing for myself for my nafs i only seek to do whatever allah taala wants me to do this is what it means to say inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mati lillahi rabbil alamin say o oh allah my sacrifice and my worship and my struggle and my living and my dying they are all for you o oh allah nothing belongs to me so this is the way that we are supposed to try to live in the middle the nafs will come in and it will uh, take over and then we will get it in control we will put it back in control and then it will take back control so this is the human life but he this is the path this is the path of islamic economics so now um, this is the order for the individual uh for the social level we have we have level we have different levels we have micro level which is individual person so that's islamic microeconomics how to uh, live and die for the sake of allah and how to persuade others to do so meso economics has to do with communities so we have to build strong families strong communities strong neighborhoods we have to do sila rahmi we have to take care of rights of neighbors we have to take care of rights of fellow muslims this is what islamic meso economics should be about we're trying to do islamic this is where what it should be not the nonsense that's written in western textbooks which is copied by islamic economists what about islamic macro that should be at the level of the ummah how the ummah can act as one body how if some portion of the body hurts the all should feel the pain uh this can be done if we make efforts to unite you see these nations they did not exist all the time these nations were created by the west as a way of achieving unity and achieving power and this gave them a lot of power the nation uh, previously there was there used to be city states and then when a number of cities combined to make a nation they found that they could beat other cities so so this was created this is a high star today if we set our idea to do this we can say that okay we are going to strive to create unity in the ummah we are going to make sure that every muslim can go to any muslim country without any visa or passport we are going to try to make sure that all of these divisions that are our enemy are exploiting which allah taala has prohibited that do not allah taala says in the holy quran do not be divided among yourselves if you are united allah taala help will with you and they will never be able to win over you today we find the kufar are beating us in all the battles why because allah taala says if you are fighting each other then the kufar will be able to dominate you and you will not get any help from allah so this is happening today so how can we so just like these people they created nation it's called an imagined community they 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 created by an act of imagination so we can imagine the unity and harmony of the umma and create it and it exists to some extent it's not dead people are uh, yani people go, go from uh, uh, many different countries and they fight for muslim causes in different countries so the idea of unity exists but it's very weak it can be strengthened if we work on it if we all work instead of studying macro economics from samuels and we study that islamic macro teaches us how to be uh, how to be united as an ummah so we say that okay such and such nation has excess of this and other uh, muslim brothers are uh, suffering so let them give let them support this is actually happening in many ways many the rich countries do support but this should be a this should be our theory you see if something happens on an individual level it's not powerful if there is a theory like the 81% this theory is driving the world because everybody believes it so we have to create an opposing theory and we have to say this is the islamic theory islamic theory is unity at the umma level once this is written in the textbooks and taught to the students then it will have more power in every dimension islam creates revolutionary pathways islam brought a revolution to the world 1400 years ago and islam is just as revolutionary today as it was 1400 years ago but muslims don't recognize it 
because Islam has become a stranger to the Muslims. And what is worse is that we are today having what is called the Jahal um, Murakkab, compound ignorance. Muslims, not only they don't know the message of Islam, but they believe that they know the message of Islam. So, once you, if I know the message of Islam, then I know it's not revolutionary. It, it uh, tells me nothing new. Uh, in economics, I am a faqir. I have to ask I have to beg the West for their knowledge because Islam doesn't provide us with any knowledge about it. So, this is the thing that in every dimension, uh, the Islamic uh, uh, business is built on trust, amana. Uh, Islamic credit is built on, uh, so, qarz hasana, which is very different from microfinance. Microfinance is that you give the loan to the poor in order to make a profit. Arze Hasana is, you give the money to the poor and you don't expect profit. You, this is for the sake of the love of Allah. In the business, uh, uh, the uh, MBA from Harvard is doing service to people in order to make profits. Islam says that you should make profits in order to do service. There's an in, in entrepreneurship, there's an Islamic model which has been developed by Shahid Qureshi at uh, IBA after he listened to some of my ideas, he said that yes, our entrepreneurship model should be different and it's 100% opposed to the classical Western MBA model which is being taught at LUMS. It's based on Islamic concepts and it has been extremely successful. So any, any place you look, you can do something wonderful new because what is going on in the world 99% is garbage. So any place you look, you can come up with new, brilliant, good ideas. It's not that Everything is already, you see, when you look at science, you say, oh, everything is already known. And to contribute, I have to do something, uh, I have to do a huge amount. If you want to do physics, then you have to do huge amount of study, 20 years, and then maybe you'll be able to discover something. But when it comes to society, everything is in, in, in ruin and loss. When it comes to human beings, nothing is known. Nobody knows anything. People are at zero and negative. So Islam is just as revolutionary today as it was.